Oh, you had him muted. Okay, you, you worried me there for a moment. All right, let's go to regular lecture mode first because um, I had a student challenge me to a game real quick, so I figure I'll play him. He's nice enough to challenge me. Got to be nice. I got to put you down as my first chatter, of course. Do, 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 do. Ah, gotcha. All right, we'll just double up as pawns because we can. TK! Thanks for the raid, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, all right, John is joining us. Oop, and Gridiron, I already have you down as my first chatter from last time. Let me unmute for my um, lessons. Hey, John, glad you can make it. How are we doing? I'm doing great. I um, I didn't know if anybody was gonna make it. I was hoping, but wasn't sure. <laughs> wasn't wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. I've had a hectic day, so I'm a little bit behind. That's why, why I'm not here. Understand, understand. Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm trying to figure out what to do. Uh, I, oh, I know what I'm doing for final class. I just had a one of my students uh, wanted me to play a game, so I jumped on it. Uh, do you know if Keith knows uh, that we're meeting tonight? He does. Okay, I good. Okay, good, good, he good. Still, he still has computer issues from what he's telling me. Oh, okay. All right, bad news, but all right. So John's here. We will be having our uh, our private lesson soon. Um, right now, we are just working on uh, I am working on trying to um, win a chess game against my student who um, asked me to play him I'm gonna finish this one pretty quick and then we can get on with the lesson I oh, can't move the pawn why do I care I don't all right so we'll see what my student wants to do here We'll try to cause some issues. All righty, righty, righty. Get out of that discovered attack. And we'll try to harass him some more. All right, look at you listening to me on the stream. I think that's called uh, stream sniping. Yeah, that's supposed to be uh, not like not proper or something. I know it's supposed to be not proper or something. I'm not sure exactly what. Stream sniping is not uh, recommended. Something like that. Alrighty. Just I'm I'm trying to finish this game up quick and I shouldn't have probably started it, guys. That's probably my bad. I'm sure it's my bad. It's not your bad. It can't be your bad. Okay, why didn't I like that for him? I think I didn't like that because of that move.
Thank you very much. We appreciate your patronage. Alright, we're almost done. So, now we can get to the lesson. And let me put it on the classroom. So, John, I am ready. Sorry about that. Had to uh, get that out of the way. Good game. Good game. Good game. Uh, let's see. Now, for our lesson, we are going to do a review. First, we're going to start with a review of everything we did. We've had 20 lessons. This is our last lesson before the summer. So we're going to take off the summer per my brother's suggestion. Um, we had a good spring semester. We're going to take off the summer, come back in the fall. So in the fall, we'll start with series 200. So I thought we would just do a recap, a review, and maybe something new for what we covered throughout the class so far. It's been a full class. So, so this is the last class into the fall. This is the last, this will be our last official class until the fall. So I'll have time to do one-on-one -on -one lessons, by the way, which I owe you a couple, right? That's okay, that's not, no worries about that. But okay, okay, but I do no owe you a class. couple. That's okay, so no classes until the fall. Okay, just wanted to yeah. make sure I understood yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, no, no, that's good. That's what my brother suggested. He's the one uh, footing the bill. Okay. So I'm not gonna argue with him. And it seemed like a logical idea anyway. Um, Good timing, yeah. right? Good timing. Okay. okay, so what did we cover? In our first lesson, and I, these lessons didn't necessarily go in this order. Let me see if I can explode this a little bit for everybody. Um, I'll make it 200%. There we go. Now we can see better. Wow, now I can see, now I can't see it. It's so big. Um, I'm going to have to go with full screen here. All right, good, good. Here we go. And uh, I am sharing the screen so you could see it also, John, so we're good to go. So what did we cover at the beginning? Now, so these won't be in the specific order. By the way, if anybody wants to go back and look at all of the previous lessons, I almost have them all loaded, but you can go back and check any of our previous lessons uh, by going to my channel, going to my playlists, um, and you will find the um, 100 series playlist and in there we have lessons 101 which is lesson one and I've already loaded all the way through 17 uh, hopefully tonight oh I'm missing 14 somehow let me make a note of that um, but I should be loading 18 19 and 20 and then I'll, I'll load this one also greeting Sudakus you are always welcome glad you can make it so uh, I have to still load 
14, 18, 19, 20, and then I'll load this one. But definitely, if you missed the beginning, gridiron, if you missed the beginning, you could go back and start catching them all the way from lesson 101. And then bring me questions. Go to lesson 101, watch it, throw some questions at me, and I'll try to help you out. All right, we'll, we'll go over those things that we covered well before that you might have missed. Hey, Gleef, thanks for joining. I know I saw you the other day on, uh, whose stream were we on? We raided somebody. Oh, that was on the group, on the um, team stream, right? The one for St. Louis Chess Club, I think. I like that idea, guys, by the way. One of the things that I was talking to Sudakus about that we might try sometime soon is where we actually, um, I team with some other people and we'll have educators, so th people like Thinker Teacher, myself, Sudakus, where we stream together on one channel right and but you can meet us and see what we do but that way we'll have more opportunities to teach because right now I'm only doing my four days a week and I would love to ha have more out there for you guys M more repetition of the concepts of the principles opportunities to practice those concepts and principles and keep because you need to hear it more than once right advertising says you need to hear things three times all right so John is our in-person student so you will hear John's voice because he'll speak up as often as he likes. Um, but I'm right now I'm teaching, so I will do less talking to the chat, as as my as my bot will tell you, uh, because I'm going over the lesson. So we are just doing a quick review of what we learned so far. So some things we learned, some fun things is how many squares make up a chessboard. Now you guys might tell me, 64, right? Eight by eight. But really, you have more than that. And if we go to the board editor and we clear off the board, let's just clear that board, we could start seeing that we have more than that. Because here's a square. Here's a square. Here's a square. And there's a mathematical formula you can use to determine how many squares it comes out to 204. And when you do this exercise, don't forget the full square. So there's multiple squares on a chessboard. So that was a fun thing we do. I usually do it with my students. I give them the quiz. I say how many ch squares on the make up the chessboard or how many squares can you find on a chessboard? <clears throat> a little bit more accurate. And they, they have fun with it. Uh, what's the shortest distance between two points? A straight line, but not necessarily in chess. I'm gonna whip through these pretty quick, by the way, guys. So for that king to get to here, takes eight squares, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sorry, seven, seven moves. It can get to here. But watch, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That wasn't a straight line. So in chess, it's odd because you cover a whole block. You cover the whole um, square area every time. A straight line doesn't, you don't have to take the straight line. And you say, why does that matter? We showed you where sometimes it matters. You need to come out here to say threaten a pawn so that you can come back here in time to protect this pawn. But if you didn't come up to threaten, your opponent's like, hey, I'm good. And they just carry on and you lose the game. We've had examples. So just an interesting thing to realize that the geometry of the chessboard belies the idea that the uh, shortest distance is a straight line. It does not have to be a straight line. All right, so we talked about that. We showed it, Maurice Ashley. Ooh, I'm gonna fix that spelling right there. Maurice Ashley has a good video on that. Um, fun, in his video he talks about it. We talked about all the pieces, what they are, where they go, right? All the basic stuff, en passant. My students still forget what en passant is every once in a while because they don't see it that often and they almost never remember to use it. Check, checkmate, promotion. By the way, guys, quick question, John, see if you remember. Uh, if you're playing an over-the-board game and you put a pawn, your pawn on the eighth rank, can you hit your clock yet or do you have to do something first? Um, so we're here in the game. If you're, if you're coming from one. So we're like this, right? And let's say black is over here. And we go here. Is my move over? Can I hit the clock? No. 
No, in real life, and, and so in the computer, it doesn't let you, it doesn't stop your clock. I, I don't know if you guys noticed that. It does not stop your clock until you pick the piece you want it to become. And the computer lets you know it has to be the queen, the rook, the bishop, or the knight. It lets you know, right? But you have to, yes, you have to pick a piece. Whatever piece you want, your move isn't over until you actually pick up and put that piece in place, and then you can hit your clock. That's a little difference between over the board and in person. And I think what happens is you'll find beginners that have never, or what we call OOPs, oops, people who have only played over the um, online, so only online players, if they were playing in real life, I could see them putting the pawn there, hitting their clock, and then going, oh, let me find a queen. No, you, you can't do that. You actually have to go find the queen, put the queen there, and then hit your clock. So the reason I, I'm going to spend two more seconds on that was just to remind you that the play is different online than it is in person. And that's one of the things we did cover in our lessons because if you've only played online and you go sit down to play, it would behoove you to know some of the rules. Rules that you don't have to really pay attention to when you're playing online. Like check, right? If you are in check, you can't move it. You have to get out of check. Otherwise, it's an illegal move. Well, guess what? Your opponent doesn't have to declare check, but online, your king lights up. And online, it won't let you ever make an illegal move. While in person, you can make an illegal move. Your opponent has to catch you at it. So flip that, your opponent can make an illegal move. You have to catch him at making the illegal move. Otherwise, the move stands. All right. Yes, make sure the opponent does not have your queen in their hand. Yes, yes, say, I, I need that, please. Thank you very much. They like to hold on to pieces. All right. So we talked about that. We talked about the different draws, the 50 move rule, the um, three move repetition, which is not in a row, but people have always, I don't even know why they call it three move repetition. It should be three position um, repetition or something else because three move is misleading. Um, and then we talked about how we could teach and we teach by chess playing with pawns, right? Purely pawns. So we, we would just play with pawns against pawns. Oh. All right. Now, you can't do that even in the analysis board in Lee Chess because it doesn't allow it, but we would do this. This is how we would play, and we would have our students play with chess pawns, and whoever gets a pawn to the other end first wins. That's it. That's all you have to do is be the first one to get a pawn to the other end. Doesn't matter what else happens this player white wins it's a good way to start teaching beginners and we talked about it but we didn't do it uh, because it's hard to do unless you're using a board editor but what we did accomplish is we would play with kings and you still can play either to checkmate because you have to teach them checkmate but you can also just play whoever gets a pawn down to the side we like to play when you add the kings you have to get the pawn down to the other side and it has to stay there for it one move, right? So if your opponent could take it off right away because his king is defending the square and you didn't defend the square, then that you don't win. But anyway, so we did that. We talked about the values of the pieces and I will reiterate at the beginning level, bishops and knights, just make them three. For queens, make it 10. For the beginning level, that to me makes a whole lot more sense. John, in your case, you might want to make the knight 3.5 because you like knights better than bishops. Right. All right. Then we talked about lead chess, using it, how we're going to use it, how we do homework. We talked about etiquette, proper etiquette, not talking smack, uh, being uh, playing with good sportsmanship, not cheating. Uh, I was just playing Xavier online. He asked me to play right before I started the stream, and he told me in the lead chess chat, Oh, I'm listening to your stream. And I said, well, you know, and I mentioned to all of you, you're not supposed to do that. And he immediately said, oh, I'll mute, I'll mute your stream. Now, there's a gigantic lag, so it probably wouldn't help him anyway. But stream, stream sniping is poor etiquette, right? If you're playing somebody that's streaming. But, you know, there's other things that come into play. So things like accusing your opponent of cheating because they kicked your butt, 
that's not that's not nice. That's that's pretty poor sportsmanship. Um, letting your clock like you have two minutes left on the clock. You're one move away from a forced checkmate by your opponent against you, and you just let your clock run out. You don't move for two minutes, and you you go well. Maybe he'll quit the game before me. That's that's poor sportsmanship, right? You should resign or play. So, little things like that. And, you know, they're not too hard to figure out poor sportsmanship and poor etiquette. Because just think of how you would feel if someone did it to you. And if you don't like, if you don't think you'd like it, then don't do it. We talked about how to use Lee Chess. And I, hey guys, I use Lee Chess. I'm not against chess.com at all. I have a membership there. Uh, but I use Lee Chess because I find it better for teaching. Between studies, the analysis board, being able to throw a tournament out in a heartbeat, uh, all the things I can do, I like Lee Chess for teaching especially. All right, we reviewed definitions, we went over board coordinates. Uh, keeping score, which you don't have to do online, I think is critical. I think you definitely need to do that. Uh, you need to learn how to do that. If you're going to play um, in person, you need to know how to do that. Um, and if you look at games, even if you just look at your games, right? So if I go to, because we're going to talk about this in a minute. By the way, John, I did our, look at your first game in the study you sent me. And uh, I did already give you feedback on game one. But, oh, okay. but, but in this game, the nicety is that you can make notes. Okay, so um, we're talking about keeping score, though. So here you could see the score on the side. And you want to learn what that means, of course, because if you look at a magazine, if you look at a paper book, if you look at even online um, videos or Wikipedia or whatever you want, a lot of times you're just going to have moves to look at. You should know what they are. You should know the moves. When you discuss this with other people, you want to be able to say things like, watch out for your H, you know, your F7 pawn. And you don't want to be going F7. That's where, where is F7? I don't know. Right, you should you should learn you should learn the nomenclature and the coordinates for keeping score. All right, we kept going. We went over basic checkmates. We went over basic end games. I like teaching end games first, and it's logical to me because we start off by teaching the pieces. Right. So let me get up another screen here. If we start off by teaching the pieces and how they move, and we start with say chess kings and pawns, right? We, and we said that we, we can have kings and pawns. So if we're going to do that, we're going to learn how all the pieces move. Yeah, let's move you over here. All right. So we're going to um, teach you how the pieces move. There you go. Um, why not start with end games? Because in end games, I have fewer pieces. So I could do this one first, but then I like to usually just add, let's add the bishops. And then we had fun because we would do bishops versus knights. And we held tournaments with this. This was the starting position, and we did a tournament. In fact, we should do one tonight for, for a reminder and see how much we've learned. So this will get a good idea for you. This will help you become acclimated to how knights move versus how bishops move. And as you know, in the arena tournaments, you mix them up. Sometimes you have bishops, some black, sometimes you'll have white. So sometimes you'll have knights, sometimes you'll have bishops. I think, when, if I remember correctly, when we did this exercise, we actually gave white the bishops because white moves first and letting them develop the knights first made it even more, a little bit of an advantage because, right, he could just pop the knights out. So here, white takes two moves to get a bishop out, but black can get his knights out faster, but he moves second. So it kind of balanced out. So that's a fun thing we did also. All right, back to what else we covered. So again, we might do that tonight, right? That might be a fun one. I do want to show you something new, though, probably for the last half an hour. All right. We went over basic end games. King and pawn, a lot of king and pawn. We went over king and rook versus king, king and rook, pawn versus king. We went over a ton of those. We talked about pawns being the soul of chess. Uh, if I say you nothing else, two things. Remember, pawns can't go backwards. So be very, very picky about when you push a pawn. Be careful when you push a pawn. Be picky. Uh, if you have no idea what to do in the position, you have only one rule. 
you cannot push a pawn. Again, if you have no idea what to do in a given position, your one rule is you cannot push a pawn. You gotta find something else. Now we gave you things to do when you don't know what to do. Uh, we're gonna be covering that a lot more in this 200 series for this because we'll be talking more about middle game planning and middle game play. But moving on. So we talked about pawns, isolated pawns, double pawns. Uh, past pawns wanna be pushed. Past pawns wanna be pushed. That was one that we talked about a lot. Push past pawns. All right. So we talked about pushing a past pawn. Past pawns want to go. Talked about how to find a past pawn using candidates. We didn't talk too much about fewer pieces equal less room for error. Uh, but it's true. When you have all of the pieces on the board, when you start a game at the beginning, at this point, I can make even theoretically bad moves in the sense that they're like, I've seen them undev like move and then move the pawn again. I've seen them move a knight and then move the knight back. I've seen, right, where you undev you're not, those are not good moves because you're losing tempo, but it's so early in the game, you can overcome minor errors a lot of times. And in fact, you can sacrifice material early, but you gotta do it early. You sacrifice that material early. You gambit a pawn early and you have a chance, to, right, you have time to come back. As you get fewer and fewer pieces on the board, there's less room for error. And that's the beauty of end games is when you have the less pieces, you have to play more precise. All right. So that's that's what that was about. And I finally covered it. I love, I love finding what I didn't cover so I can make sure I go over it. All right. We talked about different games and I already talked about that, how you can practice that. And we're go we could do one tonight where we do knights versus bishops as an example. Uh, time is a major factor. We did talk about time, but not as much as I'd like. I think we're going to save that one for the sec uh, series two. But timing is, is critical. We even talked about one of the games you could play is Tempo Tempi. See if you could just gain time. So each move, see if you can back your opponent up, make them lose time. Make them have to, like if you're playing Chase the King or Chase the Queen, you're usually gaining tempo as you do it. I mean, that's the concept behind it, but... Uh, so we time we've talked about throughout, we haven't had a lesson primarily devoted to time, but we will. I think that'll be good for, for the second phase. Uh, of course, the review we've done, and we've done and we're doing now, so I'm not worried about that. Ooh, didn't mean to do that. Meant to do that. Okay. Um, what do we do to prepare for over-the-board tournaments? Very good question, Sudakus. And you know what? I can probably spend the summer covering that. I need something to cover over the summer. And um, that isn't maybe specific for the, maybe it is. Well, I like it though. We could definitely cover that. So I will, I will talk to that question as soon as I finish doing some more review. I like the question. So we talked about opening principles. Uh, we did talk about control of the center, not at that time when I was doing the others. Uh, when, in de when ahead in development, don't simplify don't, for the sake of simplification, right? Uh, but especially when you're ahead in development. If you simplify when you're ahead in development, remember, you're taking away some of your advantage. All right? So don't allow unnecessary exchanges when you're ahead in development. And that's probably one I need to make sure I go over again. And again, that's that would be a good one. In fact, I'm going to leave it blue because I think that's going to be a good one to cover when we do the middle game discussions in series the 200 series. Um, we did talk about if two, if I had two steps in development, look for an attack. And by two steps, I mean if you've castled, that's a step. If you've, of course, developed your pieces, that's a step. So we were looking at a game the other day that Murphy played, but I was also looking at an opening in the perk where I ended up in the perk defense. Uh, Black was way behind on development. And to me, that is a signal for white to look for opportunities to attack. They might not be. Remember, you can make up mistakes in the opening, uh, but look for those, right? Doesn't mean you have to attack, but look for those opportunities. All right, uh, every time your opponent moves, you have to understand what they're doing. Uh, one technique we talked about, was it good, was it bad, or was it ugly? If it's ugly, you should be able to take advantage right away. If it's bad, you might not be able to take advantage right away. You might just win a tempo. And if it's a good move, you better know why and make sure it's not something that's going to hurt you in the long run. So if it's just a solid move, good move, no problem. 
if it's a good move that's actually threatening things, you better pay attention, right? We talked about free candy. Number one thing for beginners. Uh, last week, actually this just Sunday, I think it was, we talked about the three biggest um, mistakes that are, yeah, three biggest something. I think it was mistakes that beginners make. And one of them was the number one. The number one thing that all beginners make is they give away too much free candy and they don't take the free candy when it's offered. All right, uh, we covered seeking alignment. So uh, we are, one of the things I might do today is as the new part at the end would be three, three tactics to teach beginners. What are the three most important tactics to teach and practice as a beginner? And so we'll talk about that. But I can tell you right now, most of them are gonna be born out of alignment. Love alignment. Uh, we did not get into pawn breaks, so good. We'll save that for, for our middle, mid class, our mid, middle game lessons, right? The 200 series. All right. Hey, Irv, glad you can make it. Uh, we are doing a review of the 20 lessons we covered this year. All right, so we are up to analyzing a position, specifically tactical. And if you have questions throughout John and Irv, please throw them out there. Anything that you need. Like you go, I don't remember that, it, uh, you know, or is that really as important or, you know, please, uh, I'm going to just, I'm going to just stream through these and stream, literally stream. So I'm going to stream through these until you guys stop me for any questions. So don't hesitate. Well, I will, I will echo your comment about free uh, candy. Okay. That's, that's the number one thing. Agree. In terms of just getting better. Yes. Yeah, I find that um, all players at every at whatever your rating is, if you're still giving away free candy, when you stop doing that regularly, you'll win a lot of games and your rating will get to a nice stable level. And then you could start looking at all the other principles and concepts and learning openings. Uh, it always amuses me when I have students that are memorizing openings, but they're still giving away free candy. And then I have the ones that memorize traps, right? So they'll play trappy openings. Uh, they'll play the fried liver attack. They'll play the queen. They're, they're going for a fool's mate. Uh, that's what most beginners, right? They learn, first thing they learn is fool's mate because they fall for it and they like use it against everybody else that they teach how to play chess. But we know fool's mate has a lot of problems in it, right? And, and it, you don't have to fall for it by a far shot and you could get a much worse position and then they give away, and if you do, if you defend against it properly, which is not hard, uh, they end up giving away free candy left and right because they still haven't really learned how to play. But it's fun. I mean, you get to win some games, so I, I don't lament it too much. So I agree. Free, free candy is the number one thing. And we covered that on Sunday. That was, a good, that was a good one. I'll be posting that one also. I'm not going to post it in the class one, but I'll def definitely post it. All right, we did talk about good versus, uh, so we talked about tactical considerations, checks, captures, and attacks, and then looking for your opponent's checks, captures, and attacks. We got a little deeper on tactics. We talked about deflection, interference, and removing the defender. We did go over positional considerations when analyzing a position, talking about good and bad bishops. And if we remember, a good bishop is the one that what? Is outside or it's the what? Go ahead, Irv. I was going to say um, outside the pawns, our pawn structure, but um, it's not on the same color as most of our pawns. Okay, you both are wrong, but you both tried really hard, so I'm going to give you both a, a bonus point. <laughs> so uh, the bad bishop is the one that is on the same color, not as most of your pawns, quote unquote. Your center pawns are the only ones we care about. So the bishop that is of the same color as your center pawns is your bad bishop. Okay. One of our, and John, the reason I say that, and it's not if it's not outside of your bishop of pawns, we do want to take our bad bishop and put it outside of our pawn chain so it has a chance to be more effective. But it's still the bad bishop. It's just right. a name we give it. And we give this one, right? We call this one the good bishop because it's different than the center pawns. So regardless of how you're using it, the situation at the time, right? Because I could take this bishop, I could take the good bishop and make him really bad, right? He could be here and I could, I, right now that bishop has no real scope. 
And we could go even worse and say, okay, that's a dead bishop, right? That bishop is that bishop is doing nothing. It's the good bishop, but he's not good. Now, the reason why he is kind of good is because I can still sack him at some point, right, if this wasn't here, and I can get a pass pawn. But the bad bishop, the bad bishop, this bishop, look how bad that one is, because in this scenario, he can't even sacrifice himself to open up anything. See the difference? Yep. So it doesn't matter. The point is this bishop has some chance to do something, while this bishop is going to have less of a chance because his pawns are in his own way. But And we only, we only call that based on the center pawns. We don't worry about um, any other pawns. Okay. I have, two, I have two questions. Yeah. One that I don't think you cover at all during any of the lessons, but for the really real beginners, especially playing over the board, not computer, but over the board. So I have a fundamental, silly question there. And then I have a, I want to give some accolades. So on the question side, I actually um, saw two people playing in my chess club, and they had started a game, and they accidentally had the board set up wrong when they started the game. Um, you know, I think it was a knight, one of the knights and bishops were on the, you know, on the wrong squares, uh, or I've seen where the uh, king and queen are on the wrong side. So, and they started playing the game. If this had been a tournament. What would, uh, what would you, as a tournament director, what should you do? So it depends. Uh, and I have to check the exact rules. But I think it's two or three moves. I forget how many. But if you play two or three moves, both of you play two or three total moves to the game, the board just stays the same way. Wow. Okay. You just play. And, and that's mostly because tournament directors are trying to get games done. And you can imagine that if you'd said... Oh, look, we're on move 20. We played for a half an hour, and we realized the board was set up wrong. Okay, we'll start all over again. I'm 20 minutes behind on my tournament. Gotcha. Uh, I believe that's the reason. And I can't remember if it's two moves or three moves, but if it's like you've only made one move, then you fix the board and you keep playing. You don't have to start over because you should know where the pieces belong. You shouldn't be making a move going, ah, my bishop's going to be freed when it's in the wrong square. Yeah, um, I was worried more about you know, raw beginners. Yep, and yep. And that's why when I give my instructions before every one of my tournaments, I tell everybody, check all of the pieces right now. Make sure the king is on this square, the queen is on that square. And I tell them E1, D1. Um, we and, and then I usually walk around because I usually have no more than 10 boards going at a time. I go around and they don't start until you tell them, start your clocks. So I, I, I walk around and just glance at every board to make sure they're set up right because you're right, I have beginners that set up the board incorrectly. Right. And then the second, um, it wasn't what I was going to mention second, but because you just said that, I also played in an over-the-board tournament where the clock was set up wrong. Okay. It was, it was supposed to be, a, I think it was a 30 plus 5, and it was set up 30 plus 0. Okay. So which didn't realize it until I was under a minute to play. Uh, fortunately, I was able to win the game. But um, it, so I would just recommend also for those who oh, yeah. are listening, if you're going to play an over the board tournament, that's not a bad thing to check either. Don't don't assume the clock is set up with the proper settings either. Correct. Yes, and and it is incumbent on both players to check the board for both sides, and to make sure that your board is set up right, and that you're playing the right opponent. I've had people sit down to play the wrong people. Even though I announced it, told them who's playing on what board, who's got what color, they'll have the wrong color. I had one come up to me and say, oh, yeah, I had the same color three times in a row. I said, you shouldn't have. I gave you a different color for the second game. Oh, they didn't pay attention. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of that happens. And as a tournament director, it's, you know, those are, hopefully those are your biggest issues. Yeah. Um, now, if you go back to the, on the, your list, your checklist there, so to speak, right, so go back number 20 I guess it was the uh, I'm gonna call it the checklist right there right uh -huh. analyzing a position using tactical considerations right but the, the, I'm gonna call that a checklist right sure uh, of things to look at so sure or look for I'm in the middle of 
reading a book called the Checklist Manifesto. Okay. Which has nothing to do with chess. It has everything to do with um, just the benefits of having a checklist when things are complex. And it started with medical procedures. And the, the, the guy who wrote the book is a doctor, and he talks about how they were able to decrease serious infection rates in, in intensive care units by 90%. You know, just some crazy improvement. And it was all because, not because the doctors and nurses weren't smart, it's because they put checklists in place that forced everybody to go by the, kind of go by that process every time they did a certain procedure. And so I'm just gonna, you know, shout out to this checklist and say that if you employ the checklist, it doesn't have to be exactly this checklist, even though I think this is the right one for chess, but if you employ checklists uh, on a regular basis that are, you know, well-conceived, obviously, then you you will have better results. So I'm just, I'm just putting in a shout out for the checklist. Uh, and if anybody wants it, the name of the book again is the Checklist Manifesto. I, I have it on Audible and it's, I'm listening to it. It's great. So awesome. Anybody? Yeah, I don't think I could uh, do a shout out literally. So we use shout outs in streaming for other streamers. It's called a shout out and then, and then you, it shows their stream address. But I don't think I can do that for checklists. But I will tell you that um, from 20 years of experience in the Air Force and being in the training um, the area, I was a training NCO for a while. One of the things that I learned is checklists are used. We have criteria that we can look at to decide if a checklist should be used. And one of them is its criticality factor. And a criticality factor is how important is it to get it right the very first time. And if it's something that you have to get right the very first time, it's, it's now we're probably going to use a checklist. The second factor is how often you do it. So if you do it every day and it has to be done right the very first time, we want a, a checklist. And so that goes on a fire extinguisher, even if you use it every day or if you never use it, right? So some things, because of the criticality, we have the checklist and we put it prominently where you can use it. Other things are that I don't, I do it so infrequently, I need a checklist to also follow it. So interestingly enough, uh, using that concept, and I didn't actually put this together until you just talked about it, I, I talked about the fact that you can use the check captures and attacks and threats checklist Right, Gotham Chest uses it. You can use it, but I said as you get stronger, you don't consciously think about them. You just run through them. So in the Air Force analogy, it, because he does it so frequently, if you play chess 5, 10, 30, 40 games a day, every day, because that's what you do, that's how you make your living, you're a professional chess player. So if you do it every day and you play chess every day, and you're using this checklist every day, guess what? It becomes ingrained, it becomes memorized. You don't need to go look at the checklist anymore, right? It's ingrained, it's just part of your nature. And so again, the frequency, the frequency can play in it. And of course, the criticality, it's important for you to check for checks, captures, and attacks, and threats because you might miss opportunities or you might miss attacks. Uh, but it's probably not as critical as some other things, but in chess, it's, it's pretty important. So I agree. Use the checklist, but understand the more, the more, the higher frequency of playing and of using the checklist, you at some point won't need it. Now, unfortunately, I thought you were going to ask me um, about like if I'm playing over the board, can I have a checklist? No. If you're playing over the board and you have your score sheet, you cannot make a note to yourself C C A T S. You cannot write that on your score sheet. You can't say, oh, that's just my mnemonic to remember to check for checks, captures, and attacks. And every time I write down my move, I notice that and I, do, I make sure I do it. You can't use any aid like that. You can't use notes. You can't use mental notes. You can't use reminder notes. None of those things are legal. So when you see people that wear earphones and they're listening to music, imagine, yeah, they're listening to music, but they also are listening to a tape that says, don't forget to check for checks, captures, attacks, and threats. It is important. And there's here are some of the tactical considerations you might, you know, they could have that going on in their ears. That would be illegal. So you can't have any outside help when you're playing. All right, so um, I, I try not to look at chat because I told you I'm doing the lesson, but 
in a mature over the board if you forget to turn phone off and it pings one board it happened they carried on my game I lost immediately really well a lot of uh, tournament places make you keep the phone take your phones away right you can't even have a phone because you might use it to cheat much less anything else distractions you definitely can't get phone calls um, so some places will just make you turn it off and if you don't turn it off and you get a call uh, they can penalize you five minutes off your clock Give your opponent five minutes added to their clock. Uh, they can penalize you any way they want. That's the power of a, a tournament director, and hopefully they state all those rules up, up front. All right, so we also have analyzing a position positionally. Like I said, we look at good and bad bishop, bishops. Now we went over that. But we talked about bad pieces, and that's where it gets confusing because we use it for good and bad knights. But bad pieces is any piece that is, is poorly developed and maybe not going to get developed. And in general, in general, we talk about a bad piece. It could be a knight on the rim. It's mighty grim. That could just be a bad piece. And a, and a knight that's stuck here in the corner, you know, that's definitely a bad knight. That's a bad knight, guys. It's just bad. Uh, so pieces can be bad. And so poorly developed, poorly placed might be a better terminology to use. But okay. Uh, we talked about weak squares, strong squares, open lines, unprotected pieces, undefended pieces. And undefended pieces is one of the best ways to find another tactic. And that is double attacks. And we'll talk about that. Um, we'll probably add that in tonight. Like I said, I'll give you a bonus. We'll talk about the three best tactics to teach a beginner. Uh, we went over pawn formations not as much as I'd like. We're definitely going to do it more in the 200 series. Uh, we just recently, this isn't in order, we just recently, our last lesson, we, over, we went over who's winning, how to determine who is winning. Because that's important. A lot of times, every puzzle, when you do a puzzle, I like to anyway, every time I start a puzzle, the first thing I ask myself is who's winning. I need to look at the situation. A lot of people do puzzles and they just start looking for the best move. But I like to uh, understand the situation. And so sometimes I'll see that, oh, my opponent has checkmate in one move. Okay, I either have to, whatever I do has to stop the checkmate or I have to checkmate them. Be, check them and keep checking them because if I don't, they're gonna checkmate me. So that becomes easier to solve. And by the way, if you're playing a game, and you probably wouldn't have gotten to that situation without already having a deeper plan and knowing where you were going. But you could get surprised and go, oh my gosh, he has checkmate next move. So now you have to figure it out. Do I, do I just play against that move? Do I defend? Or can I find a way to attack him first? Right, you have to find those. And we saw a game, we went over a game together, if you remember, where um, it was a game I think Sudaku's played might have been a Sudaku's game. But the queen was here threatening the uh, knight, the rook. And there was another rook here for, yeah, I think it was a Sudaku's game. So this is, uh, this is great. We can actually show a real game. So it was something like this. I'm trying to, I'm going by memory, guys. So give me, give me a little bit of leeway, please. Not a lot, but give me a little leeway. It was something like this. And there was a forced win for, for um, white is, uh, yeah. So black is threatening checkmate. And they just took here and now they're threatening checkmate. And so one, even it wasn't even a puzzle, it was in the game. And you'd have to say to yourself, okay, uh, my opponent's threatening checkmate and he's threatening two rooks that are undefended. I could just play defensive. We talked about this as being a bad thing. We could just react and say, I gotta stop the mate. It's a back rank mate and I'm gonna lose a rook. So I'll bring this rook back and I'll protect this one. Or I'll bring this rook over and protect that one. Yeah, that's what I'll do. And you would have missed the opportunity to checkmate your opponent. I think that wasn't there. Because the move was this, this, and that. So there was a chance to checkmate your opponent. And, and you know it doesn't matter if we put the rook someplace else but the idea was there was a chance to checkmate your opponent and it, you'd miss it if you only react so anyway uh, we did do you, want, do you want an example of that I just showed one okay I can give you another one if you didn't oh do you have another one that you want to share yeah the, the study that we looked 
the new study. Okay, you're you're. <clears throat> and this first game or the second game? Sudokus. Yeah. So that Sudoku. One. Sudoku. Yeah, for some reason you have two copies in there now. Yeah, I put I put it in. I didn't realize it was there. I just put it in there. Oh, okay. It was already there. So somewhere in here, uh, there was a checkmate threat. At the, at the very end, there's a double checkmate. Okay, let's check it out. I didn't get to review this game yet, and I still haven't, obviously. I did draw some arrows, though. I didn't look at it then. I didn't. Okay, so yeah, here, here. So. So the, the black king, that that nasty little pawn on the sixth rank again. We talked about that last week. Right. Is kind of hemming in my king. Correct. And the rook on the seventh file is keeping him off out there. If he brings his rook over, which he does, the one on the uh, the first rank, that's mate, and he brings it down. But where is he going to bring it? He has to bring it here or here. Correct, correct. Well, that's where he brings it. You'll see what he does. Yeah, but he can't get there. So, so he... That, that's protected by the knight. Yep, so he's, he's like trade. Really, he's trying to correct. trade it. Okay. Exactly. Right. But Which, the right. Two pigs, but the two pigs on the, seven, on the second rank is strong also. Uh, stronger. Right? Yeah, you have checkmate, right. which was very right. well done. And we talked about that when I looked at the game on stream, that it was, and you weren't there, but I, I, I went over your games on stream, that the pigs on the seventh were extremely powerful. And, yep, he missed the fact that the knight was protecting the rook, and he's dead. And, actually, as soon as he lets you get the pigs on the seventh, I don't see how he stops you from winning here. I see. Well, I, was, I was in trouble in this game, and... Just knowing the pigs on the, the rooks on the seventh rank is a, a factor was what we went for and just to see what it could do and sure enough. Yep. But we wound up getting we were both looking at mates depending on who got the move. Yep, but yeah, your mate comes way sooner and yes, beautiful. Well I, I had I had to find the right move though because Yes. And it took me a few minutes to figure out where to go because the rook by the knight. Yes. Hard to see sometimes, right? Yeah. Because his, his is obvious. His rook comes straight down to C8, game over. Yep. Mine, I've got to figure that out. So, you know. Yeah, well done. Well done. All right, you don't need but this second copy, are, though. These are some of the things we have talked about. The, the pawn on, that little pawn on the C, on the sixth rank was really annoying. It, it looks very simple, but it's annoying. Yes. The knights in the center of the board we've talked about is protecting that rook, which saves the game because you can't take... You, you can break up the two rooks now and check the king without him taking it. Yep. Oh, no, that was beautiful. So there's a bunch of different principles or, or ideas, however you want to call it, that we have talked about in the past that play a factor here and he had the same thing work on his end where he parked that rook on the seventh rank and hemmed in my king from coming out. Yep, like you did yours. Right. Yep. You both did so good. Little, you both did well. Yeah. Yep. But your knight keeps him from trying to stop clear out and his pawn right. is keeping you from getting the rook to try to clear out your but yes, pigs on the seventh. You got your both up there on the seventh together, and that's just going to be devastating. I mean, worst case scenario, worst case scenario, even if you didn't have the mate, right? You could chase him around for a while. Now you couldn't chase him too far because of that. But right. yeah, if he moves here, you made him. If he had went the other way, you're still going to mate him. Can you see the mate? Actually, can you see a mate here? Or a better move? I don't know if it's a mate. I should have. Yeah, it's a mate. How would you mate here? Uh, in one? No, but how would you force mate quickly? Uh, rook to F2. 
two. Okay. And then whatever he does, then the rook to h to one. Oh, no, you can't do that. Ooh. Ooh. And the good news is this was a correspondence game, right? Correct. So you would have found it. I feel confident yeah. you would have found it. Oh, I had, to, I had to play around a little bit to find what I got. But yeah, okay. So that's mate. Right. And if you made the mistake of letting him out this way, you could just go there. He has to go here. And then you have mate again. Right. Okay. So yeah, you had mate either way he ran. Um, but yeah, very good job. Very well found. I was quite proud of you. I, I was, I was definitely uh, applauding you, left and right, because good job. All right, we did talk about. Uh, we didn't talk much about making game plans. We're saving that. I know we talked about blockades and pawn from it, but we didn't do it deeply. Um, and we didn't talk about studying chess and games within. We uh, this one actually, I did a blog post on. And uh, let's see, what else did, did we cover more stuff? No, that's, I, I think that's it. I think that covers our 20 lessons. Very nice. All right, we did talk about game within a game and I did that on, I don't think I did it in the class with you guys though. So it's something we could still cover, but um, I did cover it in one of my streams and I did, and there's a blog post on it. Hey, Thinker Teacher. Wow, look at you. Hey, Raiders, how are you guys doing? We are just finishing up our review of our first 20 lessons. Thank you so much, uh, Thinker Teacher. we got to give you a shout out, of course. All right. Thinker Teacher is one of my favorite uh, streamers. Oh, so we just finished going over our 20 lessons that we did in our Chess Series 100 lessons. It was a basic lesson starting from the beginning, uh, all the things we covered. Uh, we covered a lot, guys, and you could find those on YouTube. Uh, I do have my series right here, so you could go out to YouTube. Um, I have to still load 18, 19, and 20, but they're otherwise they are there. You could check them out and see those lessons. All right, so tonight, uh, besides going over the review, the other thing I was going to give you was something new. And the something new I want to share with you was the three best tactics to teach beginners. So we're all about teaching on the stream, as you guys know. And I will tell you, uh, before I do that, I was asked a question by Sudakus. And Sudaku said, how do I prepare for over-the-board tournaments? How do I prepare for over-the-board play? So I think we should answer that first. Let's do, uh, I think that's a good one to, to make sure we answer. Hope you guys agree. All right, so this is our final class. So what are you going to do for over the board tournaments preparation? So the number one thing I think you should do is actually play over the board games. So uh, this might sound silly, but if you've been an OOP, only online player, go find your local chess club and before you play that first tournament game, find a couple of players and play Skittles. And we call Skittles on, you know, casual. Online, they call them casual instead of rated. Go play casual games, but play them with a purpose. Play to win, play as hard as you can, play with a clock, play it as much as you can, play over the board as much as you can, mimicking, mimicking what you would do in a tournament. So, what does that mean? That means part of that is you wanna keep score of those games because you're gonna to have to do that in a tournament. But you also want to do that with the concept of keeping score because you will have that game to go back home and look at. When you play online, we get spoiled and we're like, oh, all of the, every game I play, there it is. I have it written down. I have all the moves. I know what I'm doing. I can see it. I can go back and review it. I can throw it into the chess engine and it can tell me what I did wrong. Over the board, you don't have any of that. So you need to learn to keep score. Keep score of every series game, make every game series, if you're prepping for an over-the-board tournament. It's really great if you could find somebody to study with. So that's number three. And by the way, if you find somebody to study with, and your first time you're, let's say you've played over the board, 
you have a rating. So let's say you're 1200 over the board. It makes it easier if you have a rating. It's one of the reasons why I tell my students, every game you play online, it should be a rated game. The rating means absolutely nothing, guys. Absolutely nothing. But you want to play rated games all the time because it will help you prepare. It'll help you be serious. It'll help you uh, have a little anxiety because you don't want to lose rating points. And also, you'll have the feedback on how well you did against somebody of a certain rating. But what we're looking for is we want to play someone um, 100 points higher than us. Okay, we're looking for an opponent that's 100 points higher than us. So if you're 1,200 over the board, you want to find a player to play with you that is 1,300. And why? Because they should win three out of four times. They shouldn't beat you four out of four times. They're not going to adopt you. And you shouldn't beat them more than one out of four times. And one out of four times means that you are good enough to give them a challenge. They have to still focus. They have to play hard but they are not so good that you can't get a win. So you get the confidence of getting a win, but also they're at a level that they're just a little bit better than you, 100 points, so they will help you improve. So right now I'm 1958 or so over the board. I should be playing a 2000 to a 2100. 2050 to 2100 is what I should be playing over the board to prepare, even if I do it online, I should do it to prepare for playing in a serious tournament. Now, that done, I should also be what going over my gameplay, going over end games. I love going over end games. End games will win you so many games, and it's clear, it's it's pristine, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. End games are beautiful because they are so clean, and there are right. I, I've we've talked about end games a lot, guys, because I love them so much. But you could be in a situation where you have one right move, every other move is bad. And we could just be talking about a king and a couple of pawns or king and one pawn against a king. You can have with your king, you can have five different moves and the pawn can move one move. And so you have six different choices and only one of those wins, every other move draws. Every other move draws. So it's a beautiful thing. It's a beauty in its simplicity. But I would study my end games for sure, Sudak, because that would be a critical thing. And then I would definitely look at studying my, not so much my openings as my opening principles, but you gotta know your, whatever opening you want to play, you wanna know the basics to it. You wanna understand the concepts behind your opening. If you are young and have the mind for it and you can memorize 20, line, 20 moves in your main line, go for it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with memorization. I wish I could do it. It's a great tool. Hikaru Nakamura has a great advantage against his contemporaries, the fact he has a photographic memory. Guys, do not belittle that. That is so powerful that he can memorize things so much easier than the next person. So that saves him time to do other things and to, to learn other things. But wow, what a gift to be have, have a photographic memory. So if you can remember moves, if you can memorize moves, there's nothing wrong with that. But for the rest of us that aren't that great at that, you need to understand the principles and concepts. And even Hikaru, if you throw a move that he doesn't know, hasn't seen, he has to be able to play it over the board, right? You still got to be able to figure it out, guys. So any game will get you to a point where you have to play it over the board. You're playing chess. You got to know how to do it. All right. Uh, a book to you, 100 end games you must know. I do like that one. I, I like that book. I like 100 End Games You Must Know. I also like this one, Essential Chess Endings. I, I think it's a good one. Essential Chess Endings, explain move by move, volume one. I haven't gotten this volume two. Jeremy Silman, I like him. He's a pretty good author, but that, I would like that one also. But yeah, 100 End Games You Must Know, uh, that's fine. I, I'm telling you, End Games and books, books, we, are, we don't use books as much anymore because we have so much out there on the internet, it's easy to just get it for free. It is. Uh, I think the books are still have their place. I mean, I can sit down and read that at night. I could get on my hand, phone, but you know what? My eyes get tired of looking at a computer screen all day. Uh, I, I, I like a good book. And I can make notes in it. It's nice. 
it's nice. And I, I will tell you this also, again, uh, this is sentimental, but I like finding books my dad gave, that my dad had, chess books, and I find his notes in the margin. And I, his handwriting is quite easy because it's horrendous handwriting. I like looking at those. I really like looking at those, those markers. You know, those things he writes, and I go, wow, that's my dad wrote that. It, it touches me. My dad taught me how to play chess when I was eight years old. So, Yes, and you can study chess to practical ones because you're not looking at everything in the world. Yes. And by the way, if you really want to get serious about studying for your over-the-board tournaments and you have your opening uh, repertoire down pat, look at the pawn formations in your openings which is one of the things I really like to do. So don't just look at the pawn, and there's a book actually that goes into this, but I think it's outstanding. So here's the birds that I play a lot. I do play the birds. And if you just remove all of these pieces, and you just say, I just want to know what the pawn formations that I'm going to be playing against. And you see, I see this kind of pawn formation all the time, guys. And you could say, and sometimes, well, a lot of times that's not Fianchetto. And you could say, okay, if this is the pawn formation I'm playing against, how do I play against the pawn formation? And what kind of end game am I going to end up with? And so this is where you start deciding, do I want this pawn push? Do I want this pawn break? Do I, am I going to do this pawn sometimes? How do they play? How does it feel? What does it do to the game? You know, what don't I want to do? Opening up bad, making weaker squares, making these squares really weak. This square is weak. This square is weak, right? And understanding the pawn formation, double pawns you're playing against. This is a nice outlet that he tries to get you out of. But, and then so you might have a target. You also have a line over here for your bishop because that pawn is not protected by a pawn. So you end up with that line too. So understanding these, these nuances of the pawn formation helps you. Make sense? Ah, oh, thank you, thank you, thinker teacher. Yeah, you guys can't see the whole board. There you go, sorry. Yeah, when I use the board editor, it's a different uh, screen, uh, screen, so thank you very much. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Definitely. All right, so yeah, oh, that's, yes, thinker teacher brought over over 100 people with them. They're qu very quiet though, very, very polite. They know I'm doing a lesson, so they, they're being very quiet, which is probably good for me because if I had to try to keep up with 100 different people saying hi or asking questions, I'm, I, I, I'm not a speed reader like uh, these other guys on stream, even think or teach. I don't know how you keep up with multiple people chatting at you. I just don't know how you do it. Uh, Sudakus used to stream a lot. In fact, I started off streaming with Sudakus in a sense that we met each other early and uh, yeah, that's how we met. So Sudakus is, is my main man. We, we, we streamed, and in fact, we did, a set, which we might still do someday, some days, uh, hand and brain in Spanish, where I would try to do nothing but speak and listen to Spanish, and we'd play hand and brain using Spanish because I was trying to learn it. So, oh no, yeah, you can start. We are actually uh, almost through with the official part of the lesson where I, I lecture. So I, let me finish just going over these basics, which we did. And the next step I want to talk about was the three, right? We said three best tactics to teach beginners. So that's what I wanted to cover. And when I do that, that's more open. So yes, uh, chat, if you have questions, you can throw them out there. And yeah, go for it. You guys can, I, I will try to keep up, Harry. I will try to keep up. And, and I'm, I know I'm going to have trouble. And I usually try to say hi, and, and, but Sudakus is a, um, he's one of my mods, so maybe he'll help me out. All right. Uh, maybe sometime we could do some practice. Yes, yes. So Gridiron, you, so Sudakus might be the right person for you. So John Irving, my last thing I'll give you for the summer before we go for the summer break is find a player. And you might have to just play online. Now, let's, let's talk about how this works. You could go find a game online, right? You could create a game. But when you create a game, you could say, I want it to be, uh, oops, let me cancel that. Didn't, didn't mean to do it that way. I'm going to abort. All right, so what I meant to do is you go to play, and you want to get a create a game. There we go, this, this window in Lee Chess. I'm sure they have the same thing in chess.com. And what you want to do is pick here 100 points higher than you. 
All right, so you're going to say, I want 0 minus, and I want plus 100. This would be one way to do it. And that's what I'm searching for. Get yourself a game. By the way, make it 10 minutes plus an increment. 10 plus 3, 10 plus 5. We don't want to play anything faster than a rapid Sudakus for prepping for over the board. Best would be to play 30 minute, right? 60 minute. What you'll play over the board, but I'll take rapid. Rapid is good for the argument. Go ahead and go and look for someone 100 points higher than you. Find a few players, play them. You'll probably lose because you're going to lose one out of, you're only going to win one out of four times, guys. So if you play them, they'll beat you. They might feel really good about themselves. Chat with them a little bit. See if you like them. If you get along, say, hey, would you mind playing me, uh, you know, matches, four game matches? Because I'm trying to get better and you're stronger than me. And my teacher says 100 points higher, which you are, would be perfect. Can we play four game match? And if they say, yeah, play them. And if you get along, you could just keep doing that. And by the way, if you ever get equal to their rating, time for you to go find a new partner. Do the same for other people. Pay it forward. When you find somebody you beat that's your 100 points higher than, feel free to offer to play them a four-game match. And remember, you're supposed to lose one out of four games. So don't get all upset when you lose that one game and quit. Right? And go, I'm not going to play him anymore. All right? So. Oh, oh uh, Harry is guessing at our four. I think you are close, but we're going to go over them. Awesome. Sudakus, you know we like students. Uh, guys, you can join my, first of all, you could join my team. All you have to do is that so that you could play in our tournament. And we do, uh, we do World Chess Championship qualifiers. Right now we're at under 1,400. So if you go there and you check it out, you join the team, and then we have qualifiers that you can play in. And I have to load the next qualifier. But you can play in the under 1,400 World Chess Championship. We do them every month. We're doing 1400 right now. Next month, we're going to bump into 15. Then the next month, 16. We did it for the whole past year. We ended in May at 2200. We were the under 2200 chance championship. And we had, I think, three to four months of the under 2200. And as you guys can see, Chess with Chris is our current world champion. He beat Monkey Play 27 last this month to take over the crown. So now we're starting over again at under 1400. And we're going to Chess keep climbing to get there. All right, I played in uh, 1800 chess comp. <laughs> Excellent. Nice. Excellent. Yeah, if you don't have chess clubs close, it's hard, but that's where, again, find somebody online 100 points higher than you. That's a good way to go. And if you want to teach your son Gridiron, uh, check out my first streams, those first VODs on the YouTube. I highly recommend you setting up the chess board with chess pawns and playing pawns to start. All right, chess pawns. All right, let's go with, uh, we, we promised that we would talk about the top three tactics to teach a beginner. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the top three tactics to teach a beginner. It's not that hard. And you guys might know them. In fact, I know you know them because we've done the tactics. But what are the top three, right? What would be the top three? All right, let me use a, so it's a little easier to see, and I can go back to my lecture board. And I can use these to show you what the top three are. All right. Top three tactics, guys. And I can let you guess, but I can tell you that, that almost all of them, the top two, are both predicated on the same concept that I love. And you guys know it. If you're seeking chess enlightenment, what you really need is chess alignment. All right? So that's really what we're looking for. Not chess, not chess enlightenment so much as what we really want is chess alignment all right let me close my basics because we're done with that one too all right so we want alignment and by alignment i mean where you align your pieces with the king and the queen or any undefended piece you want so let's find hey you know what we can even use lemurf's other game because he's one of our students and that way we stay in our theme of our lesson and we're going to go to Lemurf and we're going to look at some of Lemurf's games. We're going to grab any game. We don't care. Uh, this one, White, actually lost. But I'm going to, let's find, I don't mind that he lost, but it looks like it was early game. It looks like he resigned that game. 
And, you know, let's make Murph feel better. Let's find a Murph win. That's always fun. Okay, so here's a Murph win. And uh, this is a faster time frame than Murph plays all the time. He plays, plays really well. And he's 1,800 right now in, um, what is it, correspondence on Lee Chess. Yeah, nice job, Murph. Good job, good rating. You've been building it up. I, I, I will shout out again that is mostly due to free candy. Yeah, free candy, right? So just, just as, that's evidence of that. Yeah, free candy. Even in correspondence, Murph is finding free candy. So if I, that's why free candy was the number one mistake beginners make right is free candy we just did that stream on sunday so here's alignment this is what i mean by alignment the bishop is aligned with the queen and so guess which of our first tactics we should teach is the pin number one tactic you should teach a beginner is to understand a pin that if that knight moves you lose your queen so not only to use the pin but conversely, you have to teach, you gotta be, you gotta be um, aware, you have to teach them that, hey, if I move my knight, I'm gonna lose my queen. I don't know how many times I've seen beginners get pinned and just move the knight anyway. And then when they lose their queen, they're like, oh wow, how'd that happen? So teach the pin, understand how the pin works, it's critical. So what do we do? We block the pin. The alignment, by the way, this is, this is also why it's important. The alignment is still there, but we are no longer pinned, I can move that knight safely. And in some situations, like if this, let's say this is being attacked, and uh, let's just say I block my queen, so it looks like it's not protected, right? It looks like it's not protected. Um, that, of course, is protected, even if I have another pawn there, let's say a castle, and let's say he takes, I just have a free knight. Why do I have a free knight? because this bishop is undefended. You might say, no, 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 I'm gonna take here, but yeah, then I take your bishop. You say, well, okay, then I'll take your bishop. Guess what? That knight comes back, and that knight will take back, and it's a known little tricky situation that happens, uh, but there you go, this pawn is not hanging by that pawn. Uh, actually, even if he takes with the pawn, I could take this way, because the bishop is still hanging. And you take my knight, I can get the bishop, I still got the pawn back. But what you'll see many times is the knight takes thinking, hey, I'm protected. Yeah, you still lose a piece. This flat out loses a piece. This bishop needed to be protected and more than once, right? Even if the queen is protecting it, you're still threatening, right? Even if the queen is protecting it, I can still take it because I have two pieces on it. So beauty there. So and if black takes, you still take back. So alignment is our number one tool we're going to use to find those tactics and all the tactics, I want to almost group them together, but our number one tactic is going to be the pin. Now we have two types of pins we like to talk about, right? So this is a pin. Let's see if we can find another pin in this game before I talk about it. By the way, this is this is not a pin. It's a good threat because we're going to double the pawns. And Murph, Murph has learned. One of the things Murph has, I'm so proud of Murph. Murph has gotten a lot better. He doesn't even know how much better he's gotten, I think. Um, one of the things that Murph does is he's like, I'm not going to move my pawns after I castle my king. I'm going to keep, I want three unmoved pawns until I have to move it. He knows that. And so here, these pawns are already moved. So you don't want to castle queenside in general. And if he allows, if black allows this to be doubled, he's not castling kingside comfortably either. He's got to stay in the center, and there's already a semi-open file, and it's not, you know, it, he might be able to survive in the center. A lot of the pieces are gone, so it's simpler. But yeah, we might not want to do that. Ah, oh, I like that, ST. Pin it to win it. I, li I like saying that. Pin it to win it, my friends. All right. So I didn't see, what I wanted to see was another type of pin, so I will just throw it in here now. That is not, I'm lying, because I'm not throwing that in there. Where, where is what I want? I can't even throw it in here. I can't even throw it in here. I want to show you another pin. So let's say, let's go back to here maybe. I'm not gonna get it. It's not gonna happen. So let's say, for argument's sake, this were here. So here we have another pin. So this is a pin. 
It's a nice one, threatening to win a queen. This one is called an absolute pin, as you guys know, because that knight cannot legally move. And the nice thing about playing online is, if you click on that knight, it's supposed to show you all the legal moves, right? Look at all those legal moves for the knight. Look at all the legal moves for the bishop. That one has no legal moves. Look at the legal moves for the pawn, for the queen. Wow. Click on the knight, you get nothing. Because that knight cannot legally move. This knight, uh, let's move something. This knight can move. This knight can legally move. Might not be a good idea because you're going to lose the queen, but it can move. But if you look, black cannot move his knight. So it's an absolute pin. So the pin is the number one. You will have opportunities to make pins not only in the opening, but in the middle games. You have opportunities to pin pieces throughout games. Just going to look through the game and see if there's any other pins that we can see. This pawn is literally pinned, guys. If I put a piece here, or if I take this pawn with my knight, let's say, that pawn cannot take back because the queen is undefended. So is white. So what happens if this pawn moves with tempo, like with a check, we could get a discovered attack on the queen. And I'm giving away my second most, uh, my second tactic I want you to teach. Now, if that queen had stayed there, let's say we have this move. That is free candy because he's not going to want to lose the queen. How could white have found that? Because way back here, he could say, hmm, alignment. I'm aligned with a queen that's undefended. And he could be saying the same thing. But I'm aligned with a queen that's undefended. So therefore, I'm going to come here. I'm threatening to win a pawn. How do I find that? Alignment. How am I doing it? A pin. All right, black season says I'm out of town. Get me out of here. And we continue on. Ooh, look at that. Free candy. Free candy, guys. He didn't take the free candy. That's free candy too, by the way. In fact, I'm pretty sure Murph is black. Yeah, I remember this game. So, in fact, this is funny because when I first saw this game, I watched it live. This was in one of my tournaments, I think. Or No, I think I was just watching it live. But anyway... I immediately thought, hey, why don't you just take that pawn? It's free candy, right? I, as soon as this move, I said, wow, that's free. And it's a check. But of course, this is better. It's also a check. And it's a knight. And if he takes here, then black can actually block and make it harder for white, uh, black to win any material. Murph did much better than what I was thinking. My gut, my first reaction. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why we teach our beginners and non-beginners don't take the first good move. Don't take the first good move. What we want to do is look deeper, see if we can find a better move. Don't take the first good move. Make sense? All right. Ah, I was trying to, uh, oh, there we are. Welcome, welcome. Love when you guys say hi. All right. So don't take the first good move, look for a better move. And Murph found a better move than I found on my first good move. So keep looking, find better moves. All right, so pins though, um, not right, and that's just dropping another rook. All right, so I didn't see any more pins. Let's take a look at a gridiron game, because he's in our, our chat, and he's one of our students, and actually it looks like he's playing right now. Shh. I don't know if we should do that. Um, I think he's playing the game, let's see. Okay, I thought I saw pieces moving. Maybe I didn't. Yes, he is playing. Yeah, right now. yeah so it's funny because sometimes you guys are playing while watching stream, which is awesome. I, I, I would love that. So he's playing a Carol Khan and looking for alignment, guys. Free candy, looking for alignment. I'm um, just checking for any alignment going on. Now, alignment normally is, by the way, bishops and rooks and queens. Knights are not your major tool for alignment. So the second, the second tactic I think you should teach beginners is a discovered attack. And the reason I say you should teach them discovered attacks is because it's basically the same thing as a pin, almost in reverse. I'll give you an example. Uh, I talked about the English. The English opening is 
the same as playing the Sicilian, but in reverse. And even Licia says, if, <coughs> excuse me, if black plays e5, then you are playing the Sicilian in reverse. You're playing the Sicilian with a move in hand. You're playing the Sicilian with an extra tempo. You get to move first. Okay, so that's playing in playing an opening in reverse. A pin in reverse, in my the way I uh, my vernacular, is a discovered attack. So we need to set up a discovered attack here, right? I mean, that's that's what we want to do. Oh, I know. Let's do th uh, this one. I think this should get us a discovered attack. Uh, maybe I'm I'm wrong. Maybe this won't get us the discovered attack we want. Oh, maybe it will. All right, I mean, I could take here. It's free candy. I'm looking for a discovered attack, though. So let me just keep going, even if it's not the best moves. I just want to uh, do, 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 do. I'm trying to set up a position so that it makes sense for discovered attack. Uh, let's go here. Let's go here. All right, I'm almost there. We're just going to go here. We're going to go there. All right. And it, and it, by the way, I could have done it even if the king moves, but it's more fun with the king there because then we get alignment, right? So black, white is pinning his own pawn to the enemy queen. All right, get it? All right. Oh, I got a new... So um, Sudakas, you can use the welcome if you like for all of our new chatters. Anybody who chats for the first time, uh, give, them, give, them a, give them a shout out with the welcome if you like. Oh, I already did. My name is Buffalo. Sorry. All right. So anyway, so think of it as the pawn is pinned, right? Because if the pawn moves, then we will be attacking our enemy queen. You can think of it the other way. If the pawn moves, the queen gets to attack mine. So alignment. Now, if the queen wasn't there, it would still be alignment. But black can say he has alignment. So if this queen were not here, if this queen were way over here, then white can't take because, well, he could. He could. He'd have to take the knight first, and then why couldn't take because you'd lose the rook. But right now the rook is protected, and we are threatening a discovered attack. So we take. The queen can't take. It is pinned to the uh, queen can't take because it's pinned to the king. Now we could have, if this was protected by a knight or something, even if the queen wasn't there, this would the king wouldn't work. This would be the pawn wouldn't be able to be taken by the queen if it was protected. The queen would have to have to run away. The queen would have to run away, and we could take another pawn. So discovered attacks are super powerful, and they are basically a pin in reverse. Now a discovered check is the best one you could do. So let's uh, instead of that one, let's say the queen says, "Oh, I don't want you taking me off," and so the queen moves over here. All right, just move it over here. Now we have a discovered check. And that's super powerful. Why? Because you have to respond. If it was only the queen there, you could ignore it and like say take the knight to threaten his queen. And if you had checks that you could throw in, you could throw a check in. But you can't throw a check in when you're in check. You could if you found a way to block the check and still say check yourself. But in most cases, you have to now respond to the check. What are you going to do? You can put something in front, lose it to the pawn. You can move the king. And again, the same idea, I get to take another pawn because I had a free move because you had to respond to the check. So discovered attacks, discovered checks. I say those are the two. The next one that you should teach is discovered attacks. And that's primarily because I consider it a reverse of a pin. All right. The third tactic I would teach to beginners is a double attack or a fork. So and you're going to see why I think these all work out really well. So a double attack or a fork. So let's say your opponent plays the Vienna game and you take this pawn. So I sacrifice my knight for a pawn, but then I get a double attack in return to win back the piece. Hey, thanks, thinker teacher. Yes, check first, resign later. I love that motto. That's a great motto. Great motto. All right, so 
there you have it, right? It's just simple, it's a double attack. But double attacks can happen in multiple ways. And one of the ways you'll find double attacks, and by the way, this is to, by, besides these are the tactics you should teach to beginners, a fun part of this is you could go to puzzles, especially, again, I do lead chess, go to puzzle themes and go find these puzzles. So you should be able to find pins in here. Let me see where is, uh, so here's a discovered attack, right? Here are discovered attacks. Now, unfortunately, some of these puzzles are not as clear as I'd like them to be. But look at this discovered attack right there. I mean, that was an, the puzzles, black is supposed to find a discovered attack. But look at that discovered attack right there. I mean, that knight moved, it's protected by the pawn, he's attacking the queen. You have a discovered attack for the enemy. By the way, you also have a double attack, right? You could take the knight and threaten the queen. You could take the queen, watch this. You could take the bishop, king takes back, and now I can take with check and win back the uh, queen. So how's that for a lot of discovered attacks in there? So he, white does a discovered attack on the queen, but we see that our bishop is going to be able to do another discovered attack. This forced, forced move, forcing moves are so good. You, can, you have to teach a lot of concepts, guys. I'm talking about specific tactics. So forcing moves is something I would also definitely teach beginners. So I can give away my queen because now with this check, he's going to lose the queen no matter what he does. If he pushes the pawn, if he pushes the pawn, if he puts the queen in front, he's going to lose the queen. So we're going to get the queen anyway. And there you go. And it doesn't go any further. Pawn takes knight. We have two pieces. We have two pieces versus one. Minor pieces. So the nice thing is you can go into here, find the puzzles for the tactics you're trying to teach your students. And I say double attacks, um, sorry, discovered attacks is one of those you want to use. The next one we said was... Fork is there also. Which one? Fork. Yes, we're going to do forks also. Uh, here's your fork. And a fork, it says fork, it's a double attack. It could be a triple attack. It could be four-way attack with a knight, right? And sometimes your double attack is with different pieces. So take a look here. Can you set, and by the way, this helps me a lot because what I wanted to point out was to find a double attack, which is our next one. Okay, we're going to say double attack or fork. So we'll just go with the uh, utensil for eating. A tenedor in Espanol. All right, so can you see how do you find these? Um, so one of the ways you could find them is finding undefended pieces. This guy is defended, by the way. So I would have loved it if the queen weren't here because then I would go here attacking the bishop. If the bishop took, then I get to go here and do a double attack, attacking both of those. That, that was my idea. That's what I would have done normally. right? I would have, that way I would have won the rook and I had a check. Some of the best double attacks is when one of those attacks is a check. We want that. That helps a lot. So uh, I'm not. I didn't mean to solve puzzles, guys. I don't want to take time to try to solve puzzles. But you could go find, in this case, a double attack or fork puzzle. Anybody want to tell me the answer? Because I'm not trying to solve it. I'm. I'm ready to move on. Yes. Uh, well. Okay, thinker teacher. I think a fork. I think they use forks in Lee chess um, as any type of double, triple, quadruple attack, fork, because you can have two-pronged fork, three-pronged fork, or four-pronged fork, so a fork doesn't have to be to me. Uh, by the way, for me, double attacks can also be where if I do a discovered attack, see, that's the beauty, and I was going to tell you, the reason I like these three is your top three to do, because you can combine them. You can combine and mix them. So you can have a discovered, you can have a discovered attack that gives you a double attack, right? You can have a discovered check that is a um, double check or double attack where I check, where I do a discovered check on the king and at the same time I'm attacking another piece. You can use two different pieces because you are discovering or uncovering one of them. You can have two different pieces attacking two different pieces at the same time and that could be a double attack and I know that's not technically a fork, 
and I'm not sure that the puzzles keep them separate. But to me, you can build on those for each one of them. Now, ah, again, so I could go here. So here's an interest. Let's say we go here and we sacrifice the rook because we pull, this is removing the defender or deflection. We remove the defender and then we got our double attack. So how are we finding all of this? Again, I said I look for undefended pieces, right? The king is an undefended, but it's open. But wow, okay, I can push. I mean, is he really gonna wanna go back? Probably not, not good. I mean, he could have. I don't know what would happen at the end of that because you get the check, his king can go there. I don't see why he couldn't have gone back. You would think if he went back, he'd keep from losing the game, I'm guessing. But yeah, if we just push and he takes, then we take with the rook because then we, we see that we're going to get a double attack and win the rook. And when we win the rook, we'll be up a bishop. Right? All right. Moving on. So again, types of puzzles you could do. So the fork is in there. Um, now, double check is a form of a um, attack. But it's a double check is when you're hitting the king twice with pieces. So it's not a fork, right? And it's not attacking two different pieces, but it falls under that double check, double attack. Yeah, uh, for, uh, well, bishops too. You can fork with, well, and queens. Yeah, yeah, a lot of different ways you can fork, which is fun. So, um, but here you get a double attack and all you have to do is figure out which way. Right, because double checks are super powerful. Now, is it one of the top ones I teach? No. Why? Because I got to give beginners, first of all, they got to stop doing free candy. But then you have to give them tactics that they can see every game and use every game. Double checks are a lot, they're much rarer than a double attack, a fork, or a pin, or a discovered attack. So I don't go with those. This is a discovered attack, by the way. It is also a double check and I have two places to go. Why do I want to double check? The power of a double check is black cannot take either piece. Black cannot take either piece. 99.9% .9 in fact I can't think of a time it isn't. The king has to move. So you can again forcing move I can force the king to move. Now if I go here and the king moves up and attacks my knight I can get in here and attack the king, but then the king gets to take. So, would I rather the king not be able to get away? Yeah. So if I go here, if the king goes here or here, well, I can't go there. If the king goes here, it's an immediate mate. King can't go here. King can go here or here. And if the king goes here or here, the queen can come back and say check again. And now he only has here, right? Or he could come here if he had gone here, all right? And if he goes, let's say he goes over to this side from that check, I can bring that knight back for another check. Eh, I don't know. I can also take this pawn, and after that, that all looks like it's ending soon. I don't think this one ends as soon. I could be wrong. Check, take, the check. No, I don't like that one as much. So I would say you go here, I was wrong. All right, I was wrong. It is this one. Uh, now I'm thinking I still have to go here. And look at that. He didn't even want to take uh, because I guess he'd get stuck over here and lose quicker. I'll buy it. I'm, I'm not thinking it through, obviously, very well. Uh, but yeah, I'll buy it. And what here? I don't know. I'm not going to worry about it at the moment. I already blew the puzzle. All right. So, but that's a double check. But not, not the ones we're looking for. We're looking for the three. So I already have for you the, um, we already did a fork, we already did a discovered attack. The only one we don't have is a pin. Where is the pin? Uh, I thought for sure they should have a pin in here. There it is. Okay, I thought there to was. Right. Oh, there to it is. Right. To yeah, right. There we go. So here we're looking for pins, right? I, I mean, that's the deal. Look for a pin. So you can take these three top tactics to teach beginners. One, because it's easier for them to understand. Two, it's easier for them to find. There will be pins all the time. There will be tons of pins to be found 
left and right, give them pins, um, give them these puzzles to do. Now this one is really high. Uh, you're working with a beginner, right? So if you're working with a beginner, like I like to use, let me show you this on the full screen. Uh, one of the things that Lee Chess gives you is this. I tell, them start, I tell my beginner, start at the easiest mode. Get 10 in a row right. Start at the easiest mode, get 10 in a row right. If once you get 10 in a row, jump up to easier. If you get 10 in a row right at the easier level, jump up to normal. Until you cannot get 10 in a row right, f keep going higher until you, until you can't do it anymore. And when you can't get 10 in a row, that's your spot. Stay in that nice sweet spot and, and do your puzzles. All right? And there's tons of puzzles, tons of tactics, but these are just the top three I think you should use for teaching a beginner. And like I said, you can combine them. That's the beauty for me. So you can combine the fork with a discovered attack. You could just um, <clears throat> you can combine a pin with a with a fork, right? After I pin, I'm going to double up on them, and then maybe I'll get a double attack out of that. Uh, I, they they help each other. Discovered attacks again are the pins in reverse, and you can set up a discovered attack that then leads to a, a pin that leads to a maybe to a fork. Uh, there's just so many opportunities blending those three. Uh, will we have time? That's a great question. We are at 9.42. The lesson is over, John and Irv. Thank you so much, as always, for being here. And this is our last class for the semester, so I will see both of you guys in the fall, along with uh, Keith and uh, Janet and whoever else is in class. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know how I'm going to earn bagels over the summer, but I'll try to find a way to get some bagels.